Order. The College of Complex will come to order, please. Okay. The official meeting of the College of Complexes for February 3rd is now called to order. My name is Tim. I'll be doing a little bit of moderating along with Andy Anderson. We'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the college. And the college consists of the following format. We have a speaker who speaks. We then have a question and answer period. Then after that, we have our infamous rebuttal period where you'll get a chance to say what's on topic or off topic. Generally, we need to leave B out of here by uh, 845 because the restaurant closes at 9. Yeah. Speaker gets the last word. Two rules prevalent at the College of Complexes are one, one fool at a time, and two, no personal attacks. Oh. 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 <laughs> so tonight's speaker is uh, Casero Di Benosto Affinity Group. Libertarian Municipalism is a political program developed by libertarian socialist theorist Murray Bukchin to create democratic citizens' assemblies in towns and urban neighborhoods. These assemblies in these three municipalities join together to replace the state with a directly democratic confederation. We see the current embodiment of these ideas in the revolutionary project of Oaxaca. The presentation aims to explain and discuss the implications of such a project and the purpose of it to be implemented in Chicago based on these ideas and frameworks. American leftists need to pay more attention to Rojava, the most revolutionary women's right movement in the world. The Rojava experiment is unlike any other. Conditions between the local Assyrian, Arab, and Kurdish populations created a small society by and large ran on the principles of community economy, harmony with the environment, and welcome our speakers, Bradley Brink, right home, Carl Schmidt, and Bigelesu Sisman to the uh, podium tonight. Let's uh, give them all a round warm of applause for coming to the College of Complex. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're part of Pacero Dignitoso Affinity Group, and we are here to speak about the coming Chicago Revolution, essentially. Um, so, I, uh, First, I wanted to say we want to impart to you a principle to think about when it comes to genuine democracy. And this principle is that power belongs to the people or the representatives. There can be no in-between. And we want you to think about this throughout the whole thing. So first, we're going to start and talk about issues that are happening now, which is due to a lack of democracy. So. There, there's a, all right, um, the issues come from authority, inequality, injustice, things like that. Uh, police killing people without regard. Prisons are essentially slave camps at this point. Actually, they always have been. Um, migrant workers are being taken away in the middle of the night, ripped apart from their families. All of these things happen because people don't have a say. The, the people in power don't actually listen to any people at the bottom. And this has been able to happen due to the system that we currently live under, which is capitalism. And, but, <laughs> But yeah, so the way it works is that all power and all the money goes to the people at the top, while the people at the bottom get nothing or get spent on. Um, yeah, and another way to uh, frame this is that like during the worldwide kind of um, agitation in 2011 with the Occupy movement, the Spanish Ignatos movement, um, the movement of the squares, et cetera, et cetera, uh, one of the cries that was heard across the world was, they can't represent us. And then there was a statement immediately after that, that they can't even imagine us. And what they were getting at is the idea that our, represent, our representatives have stopped representing us in any way. And there's almost not even, you know, um, they almost don't even care enough to really pretend anymore. And uh, so 
I've worked for political parties and I've, I've kind of seen how it works and um, basically a, a lot of people in here already know as we've heard a few conversations that uh, basically some constituents can come to a representative with a problem and they can say, oh, you know, this, this is the issue I'm having as a tenant or this is the issue I'm having as a member of this group. And the, the um, politician might listen and, and, and think to themselves, oh, that sounds horrible, but uh, those people paid for my campaign or those people contributed to me and I can't shake the boat, um, right? And, and essentially what happens is we get this whole system of, uh, you know, having a few people with significant more voice than a thousand constituents or, or more. And we think that that is part of the representative system. Um, and so an, an alternative way to think about this is, um, do you pick your representatives? Well, sure. You, uh, you have two choices. Oftentimes, you get to pick between one of them. But did you pick those choices? Uh, did you decide, you know, is it going to be Hillary or Trump? Did you get to, you know, deliberate on those choices, um, discuss it in any way? But even in a, in a, a simpler way, what about your alderman? Uh, someone is running, and you get to either choose if you're going to back them or not. But uh, it doesn't have to be someone that the community trusts in any way, that the community supports. And oftentimes, the weight that goes behind any one person running for alderman or something really has to do with who is going to back them within institutions. Um, and so an alternative way that some places have started to basically work on things like the libertarian municipalism or various forms of, of related um, ideologies like uh, whatever, whatever kind of municipalism or uh, democratic confederalism. It's basically the community gets, to, gets together in these communal councils, people's assemblies, and they might decide who they might want their representative to be, who they want their alderman to be, and the community can't just elect someone that hasn't come from the council, right? So this is one way people have, people have dealt with it. Am I cut off? Um, so, yeah, so basically, um, it works like this, or, or this has been a couple of the, um, the ways that it's worked in some places that uh, a community council or a people's assembly has um, decided to elect someone, and if for whatever reason a political party or something bypasses this, the people have a right to say, no, we chose someone, and you can't just bypass the popular will that was decided upon, decided upon in an assembly or in a council. So, like, I, I think these, these kind of examples get at the idea of one of these which the people were able to deliberate on, people were able to discuss and decide in these regularly occurring assemblies or councils, and the other which we have where we really don't have any choice on who goes there, but once they're already there, we might get to vote on it. And, and that kind of gets at the problem of representation versus actual democratic deliberation and choice. I'll try to uh, be on my tiptoes for this. Um, so when we're talking about the representative uh, system, we're talking about basically a system that enables a certain group of people to become the professionals to administer and manage their lives. Uh, representation is supposed to uh, work because it is about representing the interests of the people who choose a representative. However, if you look at the uh, contemporary system of representation, what we come to call representative democracy, what happens is that even though people might vote, we, we do have uh, people, people have the legal right to vote for certain candidates to be their representatives, there is no accountability structure which would enable this constituency to say, hey, here's what we want you to do, and if you're not going to be following our desires, you're accountable for that. We can recall you. In the representative system, once someone is like elected, they're in office uh, until they, uh, they're, they're out of their term or until there's a massive, basically, uh, mess up. Which, the, which happens probably uh, more frequently than we than we ever know because most of the things are covered up. But that's that's actually a side issue. The real issue is once someone is elected, 
they can basically push their own agenda or they can try to uh, push a certain agenda with the help of other people without necessarily going back to ask the people who have elected them what they would want to see happening at this like higher administrative level. So we believe that this is not the necessary system that has to exist in order for large societies to basically manage themselves, to, to control themselves. And there are historical examples that show us that a different form of administration, an administration that would be the self-administration of the community is possible. You can see this uh, in, in examples as diverse as the Par Paris Commune, Arcus Can Catalonia, uh, Zapatistas in Chiapas, and what is currently happening in Rojava. Rojava is uh, is the Kurdish uh, Kurdish word for West. Therefore, Rojava is the uh, western part of, uh, of what we call Kurdistan, the uh, the land of the Kurds, which is in the territory of uh, contemporary Syria. Rojava has declared its independence. It has been a couple of years now, and what they are trying to establish there is a system called democratic confederalism. Democratic confederalism is basically uh, coming out of uh, Murray Bookchin's idea of libertarian municipalism. So I will first start by explaining the theoretical framework for that shortly before I get to what democratic confederalism is. So libertarian municipalism, according to Bookchin, is basically the idea that what, what he calls municipalities or localities or communities of a certain, uh, of a certain uh, largeness, Size. size, where they basically constitute institutions or organs for direct participatory democracy. This usually shows itself in assemblies where everyone, let's say, in a town or in a neighborhood comes together to actually deliberate on the issues of the community itself. These are not necessarily only issues which relating to administration. There are also economic issues. There are also social issues. There are everything that has to do with uh, with what affects the citizens, let's say, or the uh, or the members of that community directly. So, Putin is arguing for taking these assemblies, these uh, democratic institutions, as the basic building blocks, as the uh, as the primary units for thinking about a new political administration. And he would call these the, uh, the municipal units. So of course, when we're talking about a city as big as Chicago, where we cannot even talk about a, a city like we could talk about a city, let's say, in ancient Greece, we're perhaps talking about multiple municipal units within the borders of the, of the city. So libertarian municipalism basically says the power should be going to the people in these institutions for direct democracy where everyone, everyone who is involved in that community comes to participate and deliberate on the issues affecting the community. <coughs> How does this look? Well, first of all, on the one hand, as one pillar, you have these uh, organs for direct democracy. On the other hand, you would have organs or institutions that would enable the community to manage its own economic resources as well. Uh, in, in, in our present, the, these can take uh, several forms, such as uh, workers' co-ops, housing cooperatives, community land trusts, time banks, etc., etc. Basically, forms of economic uh, control and management where it is the community members, it is the people who are producing within the community have direct control over the means of production. We could say that this is the second pillar of the idea of libertarian municipalism. And the third pillar would be some form of self-defense where the community uh, also participates in the defense of itself, not relying on some kind of a centralized uh, military power, but actually taking on its own to, let's say, protect what it builds through these uh, direct participatory democratic institutions. So, so we start with municipalities, right? That's great. But of course, the world is connected, and the way in which all of these, uh, let's say, units can actually survive in such a connected world is only through 
a certain form of network. So a certain form of network has to be constructed, which still has to follow the principle of democracy and, and, and equality. Um, the idea for this network is the democratic conf uh, confederation. Uh, democratic confederalism is an idea that was developed by the Kurdish intellectual leader Abdullah Öcalan, who's imprisoned for life by now by, by the state of Turkey. Uh, Öcalan was uh, one of the main founders of the uh, Kurdish Workers' Party in the 70s in Turkey, and, and the party itself was uh, Marxist-Lenin's oriented. However, after his imprisonment, and this, this was happening in the 2000s, he has shifted his ideology towards uh, towards like what we consider more anarchist ideas in the sense of like leaving aside the desire to build a new nation state in order to advocate for this uh, for this idea of autonomy that shows itself through local participation, direct democracy, and democratic confederation. This is what's happening right now in uh, in Western in Western. Uh, Kurdistan and Rojava. So, how does this work? You would have these assemblies as the uh, organs of direct democracy. All of these different assemblies, all of these locals, would basically elect their own delegates who would go to a higher level of the federation to quote unquote represent the desires and, 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 and the decisions that that local community has taken. These delegates are not representatives in the sense that they're elected and they, they do whatever they want. No, they're always recallable and they're always accountable to the community itself. And the Federation basically built itself upon these uh, different levels of administration where basic like lawmaking power is still situated in the people in these assemblies. And the higher you go up in the Federation, you are basically looking at more like administrative and executive like um, positions and, and roles. Do you want to take over part? Sure. Where are we going? Uh, how we envision this in Chicago. Okay. Um, like so. Yeah, I like it. Well, <laughs> one little conclusion. No, no. Why you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so. <laughs> basically, uh, what we would like to happen in Chicago for the municipalist revolution in a sense, is that you get a whole, uh, all of these groups that already exist, most of these community groups do already exist. They're, they're community groups for different reasons in different parts of the city. There's groups that are oriented toward different issues. What you start to do is you start to get them to talk to each other. It's basically the principle. Um, and the reason that we do that is that then they start to realize that the only way that they can move forward and start to get that power and take that power away from the people who are keeping them down is to start working together on multiple issues instead of just being single issue organizations. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we do this through unions, we do this through uh, these community groups like I'm talking about. Different movements, uh, Black Lives Matter movements, one, No Cop Academies, one, uh, prison abolitionist movements, really anything where people are trying to create liberty in their own lives and create democracy and give themselves a say in what happens in their everyday lives. Because the truth of the matter is, you have no vote. And you can evidence this every time that there's uh, an election in this country. You, your vote doesn't matter. You're, you went, no, it's real. Because, <laughs> uh, like this last election, for instance, you had a choice between Trump and Hillary Clinton, who, like Bradley was saying earlier, neither of us picked either of those two, and I'm willing to bet that most of us wouldn't have picked either of those two. Also, in the state of Illinois, th this state is going to go blue no matter what. Out of those two candidates, this state is going to go blue. It always has, and it always will. So really, you haven't... Your, your voice doesn't matter here. It only matters in like a couple places. Go on. Go ahead. All right. So essentially we want these groups to start building power away from the state. We want them to start meeting and having these conversations with each other and talking about what they can do to start 
like taking care of themselves, i.e. Uh, fixing potholes themselves, rebuilding bridges. Obviously these things aren't being done by the government, so somebody's got to do it. And why not all of us? We, we might as well just start taking care of these things. Anything else you want to add? Take care of it. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Okay. It was a short presentation. Do you guys want to elaborate a little bit on yeah. on your stuff since you still have some time for presenting? Yeah. I'll get your back. And then we'll go into questions in maybe 15 minutes or so. Sure. Okay. Um, so I guess, like, um, kind of assuming what some of the questions may be or what some of the questions often are is is this plausible is it feasible um has it happened and so just to go back over some of the things that Bilgesu mentioned um the paris commune uh the anarchist revolution in spain in 36 uh rojava chiapas um th this kind of model has basically worked in various places before and the paris commune is kind of one of the most famous examples I think this was 1871, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So 1871, basically, um, Paris is angry enough at the French national government uh, that they pretty much lock out the military and much of the ruling class out of Paris and kind of take power. And basically what happens is you get this situation where people have to decide immediately, what do we do? And of course what they did was basically set up this kind of form of municipal control and I think like the, the most important thing to realize about when this happens, and at Rojava similarly um, experienced this kind of position that they were in where the state's power was fading um, from the area because there was this war going on in the rest of the country. So they had room to maneuver. But uh, in, in both situations, they were able to set up basically various organizations um, and uh, assemblies, all of these institutions that can basically remove so much of the power that had prevented them from doing some of these things. So, and, and the most important thing that I would want to point out is that uh, there was this shock and in, in when you go and read kind of like some of the um, uh, autobiographical material or some of the commentary out of the Paris Commune, people were shocked at basically the agency that they had and how easy it really was. So there's this assumption, we got to act really fast, we have to right, find people to take care of the streets, take care of the waste, um, basically distribute food, and et cetera, et cetera. And often what these, what these places found under these situations is that they were, it was way easier to do and they were much more efficient at doing it when they were able to kind of run according to these delegative models and these kind of direct democratic models. And um, I, I think that some of these these anecdotes and some of these stories in each of the each of the cases kind of speak to the power of of what this really means to kind of bypass um, kind of large vertical power structures and be able to kind of self-govern. Um, so, and then additionally, uh, some of the things that we kind of had to leave out for time, but then over uh, actually overcompensated. Um, is that like in the, the Rojava model, uh, it's not just that um, you set up these delegative assemblies, um, but you have kind of these, these municipalities that are broken up into smaller pieces and then even smaller. So in Chicago, you would have each neighborhood, um, say Albany Park, for example, you couldn't you know, really get everybody in Albany Park to decide over all these things. You'd have to break it up into kind of uh, groups, blocks, etc. But one of, the, one of the things that they did in Rojava and, and the Paris Commune was that they also have issue groups. So for example, there, there are organizations, um, democratic organizations that focus on women's issues, um, community defense, um, building cooperatives, this kind of thing. And it enables people to basically go where um, their interest is. Because you could imagine if, if all of Chicago had to get together and to talk about you know, all of these things that go into governing, it'd be a mess. And uh, people tend to go where something is direct, directly relevant to them. So you get more women going to a women's um, kind of uh, deliberative process or, you know, uh, so on. But um, what, it, what, it able, what, it, what happens is that a lot of times it, it enables people to go where there's a lot of pressure. 
And so one of the issues that people have sometimes when they have these really direct democratic models is that people can be in meetings and, and these spaces all of the time, but instead people end up going when it, it really matters. So for example, if they're about to build a bridge in this neighborhood, you might not really you know, skip a family birthday party to go to because it's just a bridge. But if they're about to decide on something much more momentous or uh, substantial, you might want to go. And in doing so, the most important things end up having the most participation. And, uh, and likewise, things that are directly important to you, you're going to have more say in because you're in the institutions that focus directly on those issues. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily that everybody has to go and deliberate on every issue, um, but allowing people to deliberate on what they want to ends up allowing this direct democratic model to function without necessarily, you know, having to be there for everything. So <coughs> there is also the fact that these kind of institutions also serve as a form of a uh, place for political education. Within the representative, uh, representative system, people have learned to rely on others to get stuff done, even though in the end they might not agree with what stuff gets ends up getting done. Because people feel powerless, people feel that there is no alternative, and therefore uh, they usually think that their best best thing to do is to like vote for whoever might at least be a little bit on their side. If we are able to build institutions in which people would come together to discuss what affects their lives directly, it also shows them that you do not have to leave things to other people to decide if those things are things that affect you directly. And the more that you participate, the more that you see that your community actually has the real power. The reason why when uh, people take over systems of, let's say, I don't know, systems as, as basic as street cleaning, why those things actually become more efficient, is because we ourselves do the job ourselves. We know how to do it ourselves. And in the end, there is no one else who's better qualified to manage us than ourselves. Um, I also wanted to add, uh, in relation to like how people would actually come to desire this kind of, um, let's say, self-management. So the idea is called dual power. So when we're talking about the, the libertarian <laughs> municipalist -like framework, we're talking about building a system or building a network and empowering it so that in the end, it becomes the real alternative to capitalist and state institutions and comes to replace them. Right? So when we're talking about Chicago, of course, Chicago is not in the middle of a war like, like Rojava was. There's probably not going to be some sort of like power vacuum where like the people of Chicago can say, all right, now we are taking over. However, we have to realize that it is very, very important and necessary to build the infrastructure for what is unseeable, for what, what might come. Revolutions never occur according to people's agendas. These things usually like come out of like sparks. And since we cannot foresee the happening of the spark, all we can do and all we must do for now is to build the infrastructure so that when that spark actually occurs, we are ready to roll. I guess we're ready for questions now. If you guys want to stay up there. Andy, can you get up and moderate? Andy, yeah. Can you give me a few minutes, Devin? Uh, yeah. uh, Jonathan, you're set? Yeah. Thank you. Is this I'll just go ahead and call. Is Dave not duly elected to do this? Okay. All right. Yeah, do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I can't see very well. Uh, you mentioned, you yes. particularly, I think, mentioned uh, prisons. We got two million people in prisons in yes. the United States or something like that. And certainly many of those people shouldn't be there, maybe most of them. But what do you do with the extreme case? John Wayne Gacy or Richard Speck, do you have prisons for that small group or what? 
And so, I'd like to hear from all three of you, unless you agree. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, so there are a ton of different ideas for what we can do about prisons. Some people believe that exile is usually the best uh, way of going about it. Some people believe that you could have some sort of community patrol as in a, not police anywhere near today's police, but you know, people who do take care of real crimes. But in reality, it's, it's impossible to know how it's going to be in the future. It, we just don't know until until it happens because the the truth of the matter is this is where we live right now and any idea I have could get thrown out the window day one of the revolution like it, it can all change in a heartbeat um, so really you need to look at what's happening with them now um, most of them do not get caught they don't get pursued less uh, it's about one percent of rape kits even get tested Less than 1% of rapists are ever, ever see a day in prison. Um, thieves, like, really what's cracked down on is drugs. <laughs> drugs and minor theft, little things like that. And the reason that they do that is so that they can capture people to use as functional slaves. I mean, it's, it's not even functional. They are in the Constitution as still slaves, as long as you commit a crime. Um, <laughs> So yeah, really the entire point right now is to catch people and make them work for nothing, um, which is how you have situations like are leading to the first uh, union of prisoners that's happening, that's forming right now in Texas. You have Operation Push that's going on in Florida, which is incredibly important and is not being covered by mainstream media and I highly suggest you look into it because Operation Push is a 30 day prison strike throughout the state of Florida that is happening right now. Um, they are throwing pretty much everyone who organized it in solitary, and uh, they've actually been torturing a few of the people who were organizing it. One of them has come out with a letter of what they have done to him because they received so many calls that they had to let him out of solitary where they had him without any bed, clothing, uh, working toilet, anything. So, I mean, if you want to, yeah. Um, so I find the uh, question really interesting because it's one of those hard questions of like, and of course this is all theoretical, assuming that we get that far, assuming that we can make enough progress to where we're really declining prison populations to the point where, you know, uh, who knows, maybe we're converting them to indoor farms, I don't know. But uh, I mean, it is a possibility and other places have already done that. Um, so everybody kind of knows uh, the, the typical examples of like Scandinavia where you decide, oh, Maybe we can rehabilitate. Maybe we can uh, right, not respond to violent crime by locking people away in prisons. And maybe that doesn't actually take away the problem, right? Um, prisons often ex exacerbate the problems that they're meant to kind of punish. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's important for, for me, and I only speak for myself here, but it's, it's important to look at prison abolition in the sense of I guess, what is the reason for, for prisons and what happened before they existed? Because, of course, they didn't always exist. Um, uh, so even going back just a couple hundred years, um, the, the, the prisons didn't exist the way they do now. Um, and I think that prisons serve a social function in this kind of society, and they, they, they serve a certain purpose for a certain class. But um, I, I think that it's, it's OK to hold people away and there are these extreme examples where surely it, 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 it can be dangerous to a community to leave someone around who, who did some immense harm. But there's also different ways of prisons being organized that really don't function in the way prisons actually function right now. So I would say that uh, these examples where prisons, uh, people in prisons are actually allowed to have a community, are allowed to actually have some kind of autonomy over their lives and they're not just you know, put into, well, you know, solitary confinement, um, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, you do kind of try to address the problem, try to allow for rehabilitation, and, at, you know, and, and then allowing people to have a dignified life within um, and have communities, and uh, that's not an unrealistic goal. People have tried this, and 
to a great deal of success. Prisons right now are brutal with daily beatings, um, forced extractions, um, forced feedings of people who go on uh, hunger strike, etc. But when you allow people to basically live a life, um, organize it the way they want to, within prisons, uh, typically a lot of these problems are alleviated. And I think, you know, the, the main goal of prison abolition is to alleviate the problems that, you know, actually lead us to where we've gotten in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, continue on that, like, uh, after we look at, like, the, uh, the fact that like the prison itself is a historical construct, we have to also think about, I think, or reevaluate our understanding of justice. Um, if you look at like the scientific research, you, you're going to see that like punishment is not a real deterrent for violent crime. We definitely, all societies are built on an understanding of justice. Therefore. The way that we understand justice is going to determine the way in which we deter, uh, the way in which we, we basically decide on how to, let's say, handle people who have committed violent acts, right? So rehabilitation is, 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 does look like, from experience, does look like a real, <coughs> real good solution, at least as an alternative like, to the prison system that we have. But more importantly, if we're going to talk about like more long term, we would have to like think about not only how to like let's say punish crime, but to prevent crime not through some kind of like surveillance, but just like preventative care, right? So that like we build a society in which people do not have the inclination to act on these urges, or people do not have frustrations in their lives which lead them to these certain acts. And if they do, or let's say when they do. There surely must be a better way than to just lock people like up for life, which doesn't change anything for them in their lives, nor does it change anything for people who might also become violent. Because, as I said, research itself says that punishment is not a real deterrent to violence. Can I make another point? Yeah. Um, first of all, about the system that we have now, um, we are current. Our country is currently under watch from the human or the UN Human Rights Council for our excessive use of tasers in torturing prisoners. We are, we have tortured people for decades, and it's pretty messed up. Um, well, okay. First of all, I, I mean, you guys are focusing on only that aspect of this whole idea. What, the prison? The prison, you know, oh, I that think that's one, one aspect of it. Um, I, first of all, when, one of the things that you said that made sense to me is I think if you have, you know, if you have this um, intimacy, I mean, this kind of situation where people are, you know, they're making their own rules. I mean, they're, we're, we're working on our own community. It's, it's from bottom up as opposed to top down. Yes. People are going to feel a lot less isolated and a lot less, I think there's going to be less inclination towards, towards a lot of these, um, you know, societal evils like, you know, the drugs and all that. I'm not saying it's going to be eliminated, but Do I think you have there's... a question? This is the oh. question. Okay. 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 We try to separate questions and rebuttals. Okay. Please right. continue if you have a question. But okay. Uh, we'll, we'll train I guess, you. Okay, I guess I... Never mind. Never mind. Uh, yeah, but sure. like Let him to, comment. to answer that point, um, yeah. essentially, that's, that's what we're saying, is that when you do build that power and make people actually talk to each other, they do become less violent. This is evidence a million times throughout history. You can look at... Um, even, even in just the last couple hundred years in America under capitalism, uh, people wind up being forced into the side and they wind up being the most oppressed people and they are beaten down by everyone else. And then eventually they're considered to have earned their stripes. I think this is entirely messed up. But they essentially get to earn their stripes and become Americanized. And then they are allowed to start becoming a part of the culture. All these things lead into it. Um, and also, just a lot of the divisions that exist in our society to keep us from working together are there on purpose. Like, we're not, we don't just have all these random divisions naturally. These things are creative. Uh, 
you can evidence that by pretty much anything. Marketing, like all these things go into it just through, it, it's an easier way to control people. They, it's happened since feudalism. Really, it's pretty simple. I have someone who's picking. Do we have one? Okay. okay. Um, first of all, I, I'll make it up. I'm a former kibbutz member from Israel, and I'm also a union member. And I'd like to know how this model that you're suggesting, which sounds like it's based on a communal model of sorts, um, is different from, say, the classic kibbutz model of direct democracy, and they do have direct democracy um, with recall powers, and they have weekly meeting or weekly meetings generally for issues and so on, as you've described in your model. I'd like to know how it would be different, and how it could how this particular uh, idea that you're pr proposing could thwart the the same uh, forces that's currently plaguing the kibbutz movement in Israel, which is privatization and the capitalization of the kibbutz movement. Okay, how would it differ? How would you, how would it thwart it, it? You know, and I'll let you go with that. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And actually, um, when I first started looking into um, <coughs> these kind of various idea, uh, ideas that I like to call communalism, um, the the kibbutz system was one of the best examples um, because for a long time you had basically communities that not only had you know this kind of deliberative process, um, but also the economy was under communal control. And um, I, I think, it, to my understanding, and, and I, I don't know that much about it, but um, it was also confederal in the sense that basically, you know, the, the very form of government for them was not necessarily a state or someone that they represented, but it was actually a confederation of all these different kibbutz. Um, and which is almost like a perfect model, and of course, um, it, or at least, um, it's a very good example of the kind of thing and what it could look like in a particular case, but I do think that each each area has its own particular circumstances. And um, so, for, for one thing, I think that like now we have a kind of different, um, well, each place, I actually think Rojava is, is somewhat of a similar situation in that it's kind of an agricultural area with a few um, urban centers, and so a lot of these basically the economy is structured in for cooperatives and kind of uh, sim in a, a similar way. But um, of course in Chicago we're not all going to go back to the kibbutz um, and you know grow <coughs> together. And, there are and, urban and, kibbutz. But, and, right, there are. And um, But of course, so one of the questions that you asked was, um, oh, how do, you, how do you avoid the mistakes? Right or, or the capitalization, the forces, privatization, yeah. right? right. Um, and I think that's probably one of the better ones. And this really gets at the heart of like capitalism versus socialism, um, forms of economy within municipal structures, right? Because there's multiple forms of libertarianism, um, and communalism is something entirely different than what Americans understand as libertarianism. And I think the distinction ends up being what does this confederation allow for property rights. And so for uh, a movement like the, the kibbutz, basically you would have to not allow um, private ownership of the means of production and it would have to be in the hands of basically whoever's working it. Um, That's how it's always been. Right. But I think that, and, and you could definitely say more, I think part of the problem was basically uh, tensions um, between you know, very different communities and, and it kind of sometimes leads to, you know, centralization of power and stuff like that. Um, and so, it, you're really talking about... The challenges of the Right, so, I, I guess if we really wanted to take it there, we'd get into like a very, uh, you know, intense conversation, basically back to the idea of can a revolution ever work like this in one area? or does basically become penetrated by much larger forces of practization, um, kind of the capture of these things. And uh, I mean, 
we all, everybody in the room would have a different idea of what would happen and how that would work, mm -hmm. but it would, you would really have to rely on kind of the hope that uh, you create a space. I mean, the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, have kind of managed militarily to keep off those powers. Um, people who want to come in and privatize and, and capture those lands for, right, um, those corporations, those developers, etc. cetera. Um, but that's an armed struggle, and that's how they're doing it. How long can they manage to do that? I don't know, but I guess you're hoping that if it happens in one of these, like, so-called centers rather than the, the periphery, um, as some people would use, then it, it can last much longer, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Can you speak a little bit about how the anarchists in Rojava have been fighting the war against And maybe how the United States and Turkey have been helping the government. Jonathan, could you repeat the question, please? Could you say that question again louder? Uh, I can, I can, um, can, can you speak about how anarchists in Rojava are fighting a war against ISIS? And maybe how the United States and Turkey are helping the Islamic militants? Sure. The last part, I, I uh, how the U.S. and Turkey okay, are now, the would you please repeat uh, the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question before we start. Um, he asked that we speak to the anarchist revolution in Rojava fighting against ISIS, and the fact that the United States and Turkey are arming Islamic militants and directly attacking the Rojavan uh, experiment. I'll try to answer that. Um, uh, the revolution itself can be called anarchist. Uh, the Kurds don't necessarily call them anarchists, themselves anarchists. Uh, that's basically a discussion of, amongst the left, uh, which is not the main issue. But the thing is that, yes, the Kurds have been fighting against like Islamic extremist movements uh, that have been, that has a long history in the Middle East, but that has been particularly creeping up in a fast rate in the last couple of years, in the last 10 to 20 years, perhaps, and the latest uh, expression of that has been ISIS, as, 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 as all of us know. Uh, the Kurdish movements, uh, the Kurdish movement and the, and the military, uh, I guess, side of the Kurdish movement, the, the people's armies, have been fighting against ISIS in Syria since for the last uh, four to five years, and they have had enormous um, victories against ISIS. They're not doing this only because of some kind of like uh, desire for land acquisition. They're d doing this basically because ISIS represents everything that is on the exact contrary of what the revolution encompasses, what the revolution sees itself as. ISIS is trying to bring a system of like political control over the people based on um, basically like laws that prohibit freedom and, in, in, and equality to, to an extreme case. This is especially um, visible when it comes to the issue of women, right? We're talking about an extreme case of like patriarchal uh, desire for control. Whereas the Kurdish revolution, one of the primary principles of the revolution is women's liberation. Uh, Ujalan has wrote extensively on this. He has, in his own analyses of civilization emerging in the Middle East, he talks about how women are perhaps the first colonized people in history. And that all kind of oppressive forces and the state being like the prime example of an oppressive central force are basically based on patriarchal power. So when we're talking about uh, the Kurdish revolution in Rojava, we're not only talking about a political revolution that is like neutral to other, let's say, social issues, but we're also talking about a revolution that prioritizes the, uh, the liberation of women and the uh, preservation of like nature as one of the basic tenets of revolution itself. Um, was there a second part to the question that I was going to say? Helping Islamic militants from the, oh, from the US and Turkey. US. Yeah, U US and Turkey. Uh, I'll talk about Turkey extensively because I'm from Turkey. Um, the Turkish state, the nation state, has since its like uh, beginning in the early 20th century has led 
basically an extermination campaign towards the Kurds, which in uh, the middle of the century turned toward more of an assimilation campaign. But since the uh, establishment of the Kurdish Workers' Party in the late 70s, Kurdish, uh, sorry, Turkish state has been waging a love intensity war in the southeast of Turkey, where the Kurdish population is located at. So what's happening right now, for example, in Afrin, the Turkish state's uh, brutal attacks on Afrin, which is part of Rojava, one of the cantons in Rojava, is actually just a continuation of Turkey's um, basically genocidal uh, uh, efforts towards the Kurds and the, and the radical project that is trying to be like implemented in Syria. Turkey has its own, uh, its own interest. It does not want this kind of like uh, po uh, formation right next to its border, right? Why? Because this kind of like an autonomous, uh, self-determining uh, Kurdish, Kurdish entity right by its border uh, also uh, makes, makes a threat for it because there is like 13 million Kurds in Turkey. Uh, and these people are not only connected to each other through identity, but also through ideology, through this like revolutionary ideology. So Turkey has been trying to repress what we call the revolution in Rojava. And the US, uh, the US has been supporting the Kurdish movement uh, in its fight against ISIS, but since that is kind of over for now, it has completely uh, backed away its resources, and um, there needs to be a there needs to be a really strong public voice asking the U.S. to make Turkey stop these attacks. Do you have a question, Wes? You. So you had your hand up earlier. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Could, um, could you? Uh, tell us the difference between libertarianism as you're using it in this country versus the, liber the political libertarian that's with Ron Paul and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, as, as an anarchist, I can definitely do that. The word, um, the word libertarian was originally created to describe anarchism, um, and anarchism is an inherently left-leaning ideology. It comes from the socialist movement, and in the fact that socialism is a idea that is supposed to tear down unjust hierarchies and build from the bottom up, and anarchists wanted to take that a step farther. Um, so the word libertarian comes from anarchism, and it's from the libertarian authoritarian side of the spectrum. So left libertarians or what you would call anarchists or libertarian socialists. There's, look, we have a hundred different names for ourselves. And then right-leaning libertarians are essentially the best way to put the difference is we have a pretty different concept of freedom. Um, left libertarians believe that you should be free to live your life without being like accosted or being told what to do by other people. And right libertarians essentially believe that you should be able to do whatever you want at the expense of pretty much anybody as long as you aren't directly being violent toward them. So like, it's a similar idea, but it's not. like they, it, it, it also has a lot to do with property. Um, we believe that property should be owned by the community, and they believe the property should be owned by one person who tells everybody else what to do. Uh, I'll add on to that. Yeah, yeah just to add on, um, I, I think the, the biggest um, difference that you alluded to is, is property, um, because of course we can go back in, in the United States to the 1880s, 1890s, where you had people working 14-hour uh, days, seven days a week, um, every, right, no, no time off. And of course, these workers uh, couldn't be considered free. They had absolutely no choice. And uh, people like the Carnegies and Fricks had uh, working people who were working seven days a week, 14 hour uh, days, and also were getting paid in a currency that wasn't even the actual national currency, but was a currency that basically uh, Frick you know, decided, oh, well, this currency will only go into buying my products at my, my stores. So eventually, these, these 
people's whole lives were caught up in basically um, Frick's, you know, fantasy land of complete control over workers. And so I guess the anarchist perspective is those people could never be called free for as long as they're so impoverished and unable to kind of <coughs> subsist without relying on selling their labor to, right, uh, this market that was incredibly dominant um, over their lives. And so I, I guess, like, Anarchists see this form of property as being inherently hierarchical, whereas uh, right-wing libertarianism is, uh, you know, it, it has its ideas of freedom, but it also believes that freedom to own property in such and such ways doesn't necessarily violate that. Um, so you are allowed to, right, be someone like Frick because that's your business, that's your property, you own those means of production. So those workers, you know, that's that's the free market, and I think the free market aspect of, you know, libertarianism is what divides the libertarian socialists from the libertarian capitalists. And uh, I, it's, it's not so much. And just like the uh, the philosophical kind of like uh, base of that is like, as Karl is uh, referred to, is is the definition of freedom. When we're talking about freedom, we're not. As like as as libertarian, we're not only talking about freedom from. We're not only talking about freedom uh, in the sense of like negative freedom, not being forced to do something. But we're also talking about freedom in the positive sense, which means freedom to do something, freedom to live life in for dignity. We believe that uh, private property actually is a structure that in inhibits people to have lives where they can live in for dignity. Um, right libertarianism sees freedom in the freedom of choice, in the freedom of the market. But we believe, socialists believe, that the freedom of the market actually does not lead to free lives. That free choice does not actually give genuine freedom to human life. Okay. Also, if you look at any point in history in capitalism, there has never been a point where it could survive without state violence. So, essentially, You'd have to have some f sort of violence to keep your people in order, otherwise they have a tendency to form unions, and the unions wind up working against the boss, and then the boss has to pretty much give everything over for fear of whatever, whatever. All right. Charlie? Yeah, are there any basic rules or guidelines? And the reason I say so, and I live in a working class neighborhood with a lot of people who are Trumpsters. I'm fearful that they would like to uh, exclude certain people from our assembly or even militarize the youth because they like guns. Wait, you're, you're asking if we like guns? No, I live in a neighborhood, a working class neighborhood where people like Trump and they like to make, and are there any rules or guidelines? Because I think they would like to militarize the youth, they'd like to exclude certain people, and they'd like to control immigration into the neighborhood. Who though? Like who's trying My to? My neighborhood. Your neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that's board. what I was asking. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the I, I, should have rules to prevent what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah so that's what I was Obviously, there needs to be principles, right? We're, when we're talking about direct participatory democracy, we assume that that means the free and uh, uninhibited participation of all. And if there are people who want to exclude others based on some arbitrary desire, then the people in the community, I'm sorry, what is that? Um, the people in the community who see that would, should be able to say, no, what you are advocating for actually goes against the basic principle of what it means to have a democratic institution, which is we come here all as equals, as citizens, as like, uh, as the community of this neighborhood, and no one has the right here to exclude anyone unless they have actually gone against the principle of participatory democracy. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, add on to that because I think this is another one of those questions that gets really hard. Um, uh, but I think that um, 
it's important to, like, everybody comes up with rules in, in every governing system, right? Um, and I think that under any uh, system of governance, whether it's fascism, representative democracy, some kind of libertarianism or socialism, there's always been, like, the possibility of exclusion and kind of, like, nationalist sentiments and stuff. And I don't know if um, anybody's... Uh, obviously, I think that... Um, kind of communalism and like this left tradition obviously uh, goes against that, right? It, it says that we should have kind of um, some type of, uh, you know, ways to avoid this, ways to mitigate that threat. Um, and I, I think a lot of it is circumstantial depending on which communities you're in, but I, I mean certainly there's, there, there's, there's like an example in, in, in Venezuela where they're trying to give more power to certain communities and more communal control. And uh, for a lot of the um, kind of, for a lot of neighborhoods that was really great and you had a lot of progressive results, but then there was also some very um, reactionary communities that had certain kind of powers and they could use in that way. And um, I think that there needs to be built into some kind of um, constitution those issues because I agree that's a threat um, and people can decide to do bad things. Um, however, I mean, I think like in a place like Rojava, it's, it's kind of assumed that someone with like these sympathies towards liberation aren't on board with that. I think it's naturally kind of a part of these movements that uh, they're more inclusive than, than not. Right. Okay, uh, yeah, I like the idea of uh, community group, issue groups, you know, coming together beyond their own uh, narrow self-interest, but there's like such a divide on the left. Do you think it's possible, and would, and would it be in spite of the different leftist parties? I mean, so... So you're basically asking if we think that we could get left unity? Or... Uh, like, is, is that what you're... Like, I'm, I'm trying to just okay. understand what you're actually... No, do, do you think it's possible for, you know, all these community groups to come together in a municipality and, you know, run stuff? Uh, because, I mean, there's like all, you know, a lot of different kinds of socialist parties. There's so much divide them. And then, would it, would it be possible and would it be possible? Could it, it? Might it be possible? In spite of the divide between those people, and and those parties would be kind of marginalized, and just the more community, you know, the more the community would. Yeah. Instead of like a vanguard, you know, more of like the community. I I, I get what you're saying now. Um. So basically, a lot of the divide on the left comes from the tactics that we're willing to use to make these kinds of things happen. And if we were to make this happen, like as an anarchist, like not everyone up here is an anarchist, but uh, basically if you started showing that these tendencies are possible and you could do these things, which has happened countless times, essentially there's no reason for the Vanguard Party anymore, there's no reason for the Socialist Party anymore, because you're already proving that what you guys, what, what the socialists and communists want to have in the long run, after a transition period using the state, we're already proving it's possible. So essentially you're kind of just making it so that they become functionally useless and they wind up coming with us. Not like in a rude way, but they, they like wind up joining they wind up joining because they're realizing that, oh look, we can't have socialism now instead of having socialism after years and years of state capitalism, which is what the USSR and China was. They were not socialists, let's be very clear about that. <laughs> I think if you guys are cool with it, I'm fine. Can I make a, can I make a question? Sure. Okay. I'd like to continue questions. There's a lot of people that haven't been called in. I'm going to ask you guys if we could summarize your answers a little more succinctly so we can get to more questions. Are you, are you asking if, you guys are if, if I might jump in for, for just a minute, if I understand you correctly, uh, when you say left, you're, you're including several things with very serious differences. Uh, there, the 
I, if I understand you, you're talking about the division between Marx and Bakunin in the first international. Um, uh, you had one wing or faction which felt that they had the correct blueprint, and you had the other tendency which felt that uh, <coughs> human desires are so diverse that imposing a blueprint on the future is, is ridiculous. Um, there's a line that, that whoever has plans for after the revolution is a reactionary. Um, Marx and, and his followers were extremely disciplined and were able to take over the, the organizational structure of the First International and capture it, but there were so many people who didn't want anything to do with that kind of regimentation that it ended up destroying the organization. Um, so when you say the left, um, you're lumping together <coughs> They're going to jump Two in in about 10 seconds. understandings that are Just really opposed to each other. Uh, the anarchist side says people will do as they will. There are myriad desires. There are myriad <laughs> things to organize around and ways of organizing. And then you've got the Marxists who yeah, say, this well, is really we're good, but it's more appropriate for rebuttals. This is really good, what you just said, but it's more appropriate for rebuttals. Okay. Um, <laughs> could you all uh, describe the institutions of direct democracy again? I, I was interrupted, uh, distracted for a second. I think you may have got, gotten into it. But could you repeat in a couple sentences what the exact uh, uh, decision making uh, institutions are? Yeah, um, so the, the, the most basic one would be the assemblies in the neighborhoods or like whatever is the smallest unit of this uh, of this form of uh, of this form of like network there would be open assemblies for people to like bring issues and to discuss and decide on together these assemblies then can convene in like larger assemblies to form certain forms of like councils in the neighborhoods the councils themselves would then send delegates to higher level councils Let's say, let's take the example of Chicago, right? Let's say you have multiple assemblies in a neighborhood. They all come together in a larger assembly. They send a delegate to, let's say, North Side Council, right? And then you would have the North Side Council. Well, the North Side Council is happening. There would also be councils in the South Side, in the West Side. All of these councils would then also come together to like a Chicago Council. Chicago Council would come together with like other cities in, in Illinois, etc., etc. So it's a delegation model, a confederation model where like these units are co connected to each other through accountable delegates. Does that make can sense? I also make a real quick point about that? Also, you're not necessarily voting on things that don't matter to you. Um, basically, the majority like. You'd mostly ignore like what doesn't affect you because like if you don't really care then why would you vote? So like if it directly affects you then that decision should be made. If not like because most things don't require central authority. Like you don't need the entire nation to get together and have a whole vote about something ninety percent of the time. I mean how often is that really, really necessary? How are you gonna collect taxes? Mm. <laughs> no I mean, you need. You don't need taxes. It's voluntary association. There's, there's, okay. There's a million ways to do it. There's uh, unions, union dues. Those are not a tax. It's dues that you pay to be a part of this association because you believe in this association. And those dues wind up going to helping other people organize or to going to certain projects, going to this, going to this, going to this. You don't just pay taxes that go to things that you're never going to agree with, essentially. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of doing that, too. Like, this is all things that we can't know yet. Okay. There's also the fact that when we're talking about things like work, work, direct work, oh, goodness, like worker corporatives, right, that end up making profit. That profit is part of the community. Whatever it gets, like, the surplus of labor is 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 it's the communities, and therefore other projects that the community <coughs> needs resources for are already going to be uh, created out of what it what it produces itself. Does that make sense?
Yeah. 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 I I also think that like um, when we're talking about like taxes, it's good to remember like uh, maybe this is the model that they have, um, you know, in various places, and they have their own ways of thinking about like how to distribute resources. But I think. Um, when we're talking about like a project for Chicago, taxes will go on as normal while you're trying to organize these things. I hope that's fair to say. But like, um, for example, uh, Jackson, Mississippi elected uh, a mayor who basically is into the idea of allowing these kind of deliberative processes or uh, communal councils to make decisions on budgeting and stuff. So basically, uh, you know, you get into the mayorship, um, you allow taxes to be collected just as normal. But in this meantime, uh, you know, in the near future, um, they're basically giving the ability for people to decide in these kind of people's assemblies, um, and that you know, there's a long transition to getting to a place where you would ideally be without, you know, taxation or something. But I would say for now, it goes on as normal um, until some there's like a radical transformation. We get the next question over here. All right. Uh, you mentioned the uh, that uh, this system is based on voluntary association. Uh, if that were the case, or if that is the case, how does uh, how are how does how does one then uh, socialize the means of production without any sort of coercion? Yeah. Um, so, well, actually, could could you just repeat it in another way? I just want to make sure. Um, maybe if, if this is all question. voluntary, uh, then I, I, I'm, I'm a, then I imagine that you would have to agree to be join these councils or to, to be ruled by these sort you're, of? You're not being ruled by anyone. That's, okay, well then that's how, how really do you, bad right, without there. coercion, if this is all voluntary, yeah. uh, how, do you, how do you get people to socialize the means of production? You're talking about getting from capitalism now to there. Um, so right. I, I, I can respond the best way I know how. Um, like, uh, I, could, I could interpret your question a couple different ways, but um, I think that, for example, when we're talking about um, collectively owned uh, production, um, it's, a, it's quite easy to imagine non-coercive ways. So, for example, if, um, if you're having to all be in cooperatives or kibbutz style or something like that, you join because, you know, there's a revenue, revenue to be had or there's something to be produced in and distributed, um, and that is valuable, so you do it. I, I don't think that's necessarily coercive, um, or you know, forming a cooperative that is the the production is cooperatively owned. Um, I, I that's a voluntary association you're getting into. So, so then so, how do you how do uh, like say that this uh, you know the the Albany Park uh, widget factory uh, resides in the I guess jurisdiction of this uh, Albany Park Council, how, how are you going to uh, get this widget factory to collectivize its They production? don't have to be a part of the Albany Park thing. They don't have, you don't have to be a part of anything. Okay. It's just this is how things will be run because people inherently do want to have their voice heard. People want to have these things. And as these things grow, people have a tendency to join them. This has been evidenced a million times. You just, yeah, it's just, it's just human history and reality. I feel like it's a valid question. Like in Rojavo too, like, it's not like there has been a total trans transition, right? They, there are still like private businesses operating because like this transition takes time. However, they see that more and more worker cooperatives like gain power over, let's say, how we how we usually like see business. So it's not going to be coercive because it's voluntary, which also means it's going to happen over time. We cannot, I cannot um, realistically think of like a snap transition. But over time, as you build these structures and the people get empowered through these structures, they tend to go towards places where they have control instead of like the bosses having control. Does that answer Doesn't all this hinge on basically honesty? I mean, how do we enforce honesty? How do you cut the cards? How do you uh, govern or have, have a court system that makes sure that these things are done? I mean, if you give somebody a job to fix a pothole, 
Well, to think of an opportunity to take advantage of a situation, they might do that. I mean, how, how there, take advantage? There, of there has to be complete transparency. There has to be procedures that enable all decisions that are that are taken to be transparently implemented, right? So you would need to like you would need to have a system which basically shows everything that is being done uh, following the decision that's taken. And if people see that, let's say these delegates are like taking on things that have not been decided upon, then the community gathers together and takes away the powers of like administration from that from those people. It's another form of bureaucracy. You have to have bureaucracy to, or a court system or something, a police system it, it, to manage it, I mean, to enforce it. So, so you're saying that there has to be a group of people that are always well, so watching it? I mean, I you, have have to, you, you, you have to depend on honesty to do all these things. It's not going to happen. People are not going to be that honest. There's going to be some corruption involved with these things. That's the problem. That's the problem. Well, I, where was the capitalism. Corruption I don't care if it's this no. running city government. Chicago is it's corruption it's dishonesty I, I, yes yeah, that's I, the whole that's the whole I could issue. respond I, I mean to to a large extent I think that yeah there's always been people who have uh, acted out of self-interest um, but I, I think that there's there's actually ways that um, systems uh, work that either mitigate that or exacerbate it, make it worse. Um, so we can talk about corporate structures that really have no accountability, right, because there is such an intense hierarchy and you might say that it exacerbates a certain amount of self-interest. You have people, you know, uh, uh, totally tanking the economy, walking away with bonuses, right? Um, so, I mean, that's, that's like a, a way of a, having a system run a certain way to kind of exacerbate certain issues. But I think that when you're talking about like worker-owned spaces, there's actually an interest in all these people holding people accountable. So, for example, um, a lot of uh, worker-owned businesses actually hire managers or accountants because it's an interest to them, right? But they have the ability to basically hire or fire a manager. Um, and in doing so, they have an interest in keeping that person accountable, which is totally different than having a management who basically is to fire all the workers. And, you know, oftentimes we see uh, a management, an executive, firing workers who are trying to unionize or something. I think when, when you have worker cooperations, worker-owned businesses, they still have an interest in those businesses continuing. Um, and they also have an interest in holding management that they hire accountable. And that has, has been shown to kind of go on and uh, work rather Thank efficiently. Thank so. you, love. All right. Who has not had a question? Did you have a question? I don't know. He's not. Can I have this gentleman? Can I speak to the uh, lady there? Uh, yeah. Uh, how long have you been in this country? Uh, 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 I've been here for five years now. Well, that's what I don't like. You DACA people, you immigrants, we, we let you come in, and now you're talking about overthrowing the country. I don't like that. But aren't we all citizens of the world, and can we talk about revolution independent of, like, our citizenship? Because those things are arbitrary. Where I'm born, I didn't choose. And I still believe in the same ideas. And therefore, now I'm living here, and therefore, now this is my living space, and right. therefore, I'm working here for my own ideas. Andy, it's time to go to rebuttal. Yeah, yeah. Right here. Okay, it's, uh, how many people give our speakers a hand tonight to go to rebuttal? Okay, people, uh, can we have a show of hands of who wants to have a rebuttal tonight? Count the hands. All right. Anybody who wants to get a rebuttal, raise your hand now. Don't come up later after it's too late. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's eight. About four minutes, Andy. We're not going to have time for four minutes with 14 people. Four minutes or less. Damn. Can we just stay past the time we're allowed? We'll start with our case. Uh, less than four minutes. Okay, uh, four minutes apiece, and we'll, uh, we'll go with that. I'm going first. All right, let's take our speakers. Okay, here we go again. A bunch of young people wanted to come up 
and reform the government because they don't like the way our present government is operating. I have to applaud you for your initiative and your, um, you know, your platitudes, but we have something that works. It's called representative democracy. Works for who? You know, and the thing is, if you have this structure in place, it can be reformed. There are ways of redress in the United States. I will focus on one issue, for example. Look at how fast our attitudes changed about gay marriage. I've heard in 20 Look at how fast our attitudes changed about, like with the Me Too movement coming in. How fast? They are. How fast? The point of the matter is, is that the world is generally sped up. People are a lot more happier around the world, and that's something that's been bared out by the evidence. Just go to humanprogress.org and you'll find out. What needs to happen, I think, is not, we've had over 200 years of capitalism, bringing businesses, people together, voting with their dollars on what they do, and that's what creates markets, and, and usually they work, but there is something you have to understand. There is a, capitalism is based on trust. It's based on trusting that I have a dollar and that I can buy something with it. And where I go, I vote with that dollar. When you have local governance, anybody have ever heard of a condominium association? Yes, where you have a bunch of residents together. I have a friend of mine who works for a condominium association servicing organization. Most of these people transfer out the functions of their governance, they pay their bills, they uh, of uh, maintenance on their condos, and farm it out to uh, this organization so they don't have to deal with it. They meet a couple times a year. But I have seen some real egregious examples just here locally of what can happen under some form of commune government. The first thing that usually goes is the pool because it's hard, hard to maintain. The second thing is they look at their electric bill. And he, at one particular example, a bunch of these people took over the association. They started taking out, out of two light bulbs, one only so that they could reduce their electric bills. And they wound up getting a big surplus of money, and then uh, what did they want to do with it? Have a big, big party with it, and that was against their rules. It, we have in our country, I still believe, a good fundamental respect for the rule of law. And there are ways of redressing grievances. Big companies need big unions to countervail that power. Big legislatures and big bunch of corporate governance needs people to get involved and vote. Yes, maybe, maybe our system is somewhat corrupt, but I can tell you right now, I'm much better under the governance of the United States than they would be anywhere else in the world. Okay. Thank uh, you. Let's like to thank oh. the speaker. We've had many types of speeches like this. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers. We, yes. We've had many speeches like yes. this. Uh, some of these groups go somewhere, and most of them, I'm afraid, go nowhere. I have to be honest. Uh, but I like the idea of coming together. There was a book, and I forget the author, uh, The Great Turning. Uh, I spoke to the author. He didn't know anything about community organizing. But community organizing is one way to do this. And you talked about that, the uh, No Cop Academy. I think somebody mentioned 
that. Uh, of course, who knows what that is? Well, I know um, because I'm in Jane Adams Senior Caucus. Jane Adams Senior Caucus of 501C43 and Jane Adams Senior Seniors in Action of 501C4. And of course, we have a sort of democracy. We're sort of a grassroots group like this. We have a sort of uh, a democracy where everybody can participate. And of course, it's all seniors, but hey, we have no age limit. You could be two years old, I guess, and join if you pay your dues. <laughs> and I'll pay them for you if you don't have the money. So we do things like that. We do combine with other groups. But uh, I guess the uh, problem is in the details. How do you get all these groups together? Will this work? Well, we will see. But I'll tell you what, when you, if you get that act together, you will see that Jane Adams Senior Caucus and Jane Adams Seniors in Action, nine chance out of 10, will be part of that movement and uh, maybe we'll make things better. Maybe. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Speaking of Trump and Rauner, oh God. our big bad Republicans. <laughs> Republicans aren't all that bad. They're not all that so bad. Us are <laughs> they're supposed to be tough. And the only reason I really wanted Trump and Rauner in office was to get rid of corruption. I don't need Trump to start wars, to screw the environment, to give tax breaks to billionaires. That's not of interest to the common man. I want him to get rid of corruption, crooks, him and Robert. That's the only thing I wanted these big bad guys to do. Anyway, I'll make this brief. Uh, speaking of crooks, on a local level, uh, we're all familiar with Mayor Daly's new meters we've had for several years now. Uh, can you guys find out if the Mayor Daly family profits uh, from the, those meters? Dubai. Yeah, it's a company somewhere mysterious. Mars. No, it's, it's in Dubai. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, it's Dubai. Dubai. It's it's real big. Big. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No, it's Mayor Daly's <laughs> family. Well, they paid him. With the lawyers who were they paid him, yeah. Why do you All right, so, that's, so those are crooked Democrats. I am a bipartisan uh, hater. So Republicans and Democrats are corrupt. And one last thing, since you guys, we don't talk about ISIS or the Middle East nearly enough here. Can you guys, uh, maybe you know, uh, did, um, now with Cheney and Halliburton, we started the Iraq oil war, the Halliburton war. Now, um, did we um, did we create ISIS? I, I think the Iraq. I think ISIS is the Iraq Army. I believe. Check that. I believe they went underground, and the Iraq Army went underground, and now is ISIS. Pretty sure. Where'd you hear that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I got my sources. All right, and then now that we have all these um, refugees drowning in the Mediterranean, also, is that because of American wars? Dick Cheney, Halliburton, our War Department? Is that why there's like refugees fleeing the Middle East? Because of Wall Street in our War Department? Gotta have wars? Check on that stuff. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. USA. USA. Spoken like hey guys, a I, I'm not really prepared to rebut all this. Please. I just actually didn't get any questions in that I wanted to get. But I was just wondering about this. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Tom Hodgkinson. He wrote the Freedom Manifesto, which is a really, really fun book. If anyone gets a chance to read the Freedom Manifesto. Uh, it talks about anarchy. He's big on anarchy, but his idea of anarchy is the medieval guild. And I know there's some connection here uh, with me. When I, I, I just saw this particular topic, a libertarian 
Invisible. Invisible. And I was, actually, I was discussing with my son, and he goes, well, that's, there's a, there is a term for that, because I was telling him what I was thinking. You know, just starting from the bottom up, as opposed to, you know, the, the corporation, Walmart society, we're, you know, government is almost like Walmart in the sense that they control from the top. And I go to Walmart and I want to buy something, well, we no longer take it. Why not? Didn't it sell? It was great. I loved it. No. It doesn't matter if it's sold because it's from the top down as opposed to the bottom up. So the point I was wondering about, now this seems very, uh, it's very socialist, okay. I, I'm not anti-socialist in, in this particular scale. I, I li tend to like it, but I like the fact of not being coerced. And you seem to say that it wasn't coercion. I like that. Um, but I was wondering about the same concept but more like in the middle, middle medieval times when people, you know, there would be the, the black, um, the, the shoe, rep not shoe repair, it would be the guy, the blacksmith and the, and, you know, all these different little, little um, businesses that would, you know, they would make money and there was no, it was not socialistic to my understanding, in my understanding it wasn't socialistic. But these different little businesses, and they'd all, but they'd all cooperate, and then, you know, coming together, small, everybody, there's small businesses and private property, but coming together, uh, perhaps paying fees, whatever, for the common good, and then, and then, you know, voting on things, and picking a representative, and doing the same thing that you are promoting, except not necessarily uh, in a socialist s scenario. It, once again, I think within these particular municipalities, some might be socialists and some might not be. You may, I would think you could have a, munis a socialist municipality because they all, just, they all voluntarily decided to do that. And another group decided that we're, not, we're all gonna keep, retain our own property, we're gonna have our own businesses, but yet we're gonna come together in these in these um, these uh, delegations or whatever whatever your term is, and then do it that way, and then from the bottom up, bring these people and, and have everybody have these delegates come back and say, what do you guys think? Let's vote on this particular idea, rather than having these these you know government these people in government who are being paid hundreds of thousands just to rule our country. And, and even when they're retired, they get all this money, and it's like, why are they doing this? I don't even care about this guy. Why is he being paid all this money? <coughs> so, um, so I guess that's um, my question to them would be if you think this could happen Shit, sorry. in uh, partially privatized and par partially socialized, and also, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, um, if um, when we get to the top, I mean, if we. Is there a way to, are, are being, people being paid for these rules, or are they doing them voluntarily? That's another thing. Thank you. I've got 20 seconds to go. Thank you, guys. That was very interesting. Can you answer anything? Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys, um, for your presentation. Um, excellent. Um, and I share um, a lot of these ideas. As a matter of fact, and I've been preaching here about uh, direct democracy. As a matter of fact, um, representative democracy, that term is, is a contradiction in terms. It's, that's, uh, you're all, you either have power belonging to the people, as you all said, or uh, power in the elite. And the representatives simply represent the elite in the system. Um, so we have to be voting on issues, and I would um, uh, speak for, for, for doing it only that way and not having delegates at all. And I, I have uh, thought up of a system uh, where you have um, community assemblies, okay, but then you have random sample councils, and you guys are probably somewhat familiar with that. That's where I would go. I wouldn't have any delegates at all, because once you have uh, representatives of any kind, then they, they are either uh, have their own interests, 
or they uh, are uh, coerced or, or uh, controlled by higher elites. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that way at all. <clears throat> so this system um, that I have devised is based on, um, on ancient Athens, which I'm sure you guys are somewhat familiar with as well, that just expanded. You have, you have just a whole lot of assemblies and a whole lot of councils throughout, throughout the country. I also um, didn't hear you say too much about uh, getting rid about getting rid of the current systems, uh, our current institutions, okay? You cannot leave these in place. The United States government is not going to roll over for your community assemblies or com whatever, okay? You have to get rid of the current uh, system of government. Um, they have enormous power. You're not going to get rid, and then when you expand this to the world, which it will eventually have to be done, you're not going to get rid of the, of the, of the uh, Chinese government. Okay, just by, you know, saying, you know, we have a better way. No, you, you, we're going to have to, it's going to be a huge fight, and we have to face that fact. Um, you, you mentioned the model of the Paris Commune. Why didn't the Paris Commune succeed? Not because it, it wasn't a good idea. It was. You described how, how good it was. It was because it was very, it was too small. Okay, we can't think small in, in this, in this, in this uh, uh, struggle that we're in. Um, you have to take over the whole, the whole of France, and then, you know, the whole of the United States. Um, and we also, I think, have to face um, the issue of power more directly. That's where I have an issue with most anarchists. Uh, to say the least, they don't want to deal with power and structures of power. Okay, that's like, okay, we can't go there. No, you have to go there, and we have to have coercion, and we're going to have to have police and courts. Okay, and just they're going to have to be people's police and people's courts to uh, uh, enforce people's uh, policies and, and, and laws. Okay, uh, the, the the elites, the rich, are not going to. Uh, you know, voluntarily pay taxes, never, okay, they're not, or their fair share of taxes. They're not going to voluntarily give up the power they have over our entire environment, okay. They're, you're going to have to use uh, literally force, okay, uh, but it, hopefully you won't get to that point, but you're going to have to have um, uh, systems of, of compulsion, okay, and I think we have to face that directly. And I'll uh, be talking to you guys uh, after this is done because I want to communicate with you guys later. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Brother Joe, retired Teamster, Local 705, stop moving backwards. I want to thank the speakers today. Uh, Go back from the mic a little bit. I mean, don't, don't, don't uh, let's do it like the Lemmy style. Let's just start it back there. All right, all right. Yeah, but, uh, yeah so uh, I, want to, I want to thank them for uh, coming here today and speaking. You know, uh, they, they give me hope because I'm, I'm kind of jaded, you know, in uh, my organizing everything I do and having some victories and everything like that, but I, I am a little jaded, and I want to thank them uh, for giving me hope here, you know. And uh, now there, there's a few things uh, people were talking about, right? Um, and, uh, and I think the most, one of the things, whatever we do, we need to be able to defend our gains. You know, we need to be able to defend whatever we do, whether we seize the means of production, or we create our own means of production, so on and so forth. And we need to be able to defend whatever we do, whatever, whatever we create. You know, without that, we won't be able, be able to keep it. So, I mean, I think that's uh, very, very important. Um, also, I wanted to talk about um, uh, the thing that's going on in, uh, with Turkey, right? Um, and they uh, spoke to, there was a protest last week, and there was another protest this week, this is what you know. Governments do, you know. They, uh, you know, fund different organizations, different militias, different militants, you know, to do their dirty work. And when when that's done, what they what they do is then try to get rid of them. Now, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you know Taliban were great, but if you go back and watch the Rambo movie, Rambo was you know on the side of the Taliban in the movie in the movie Rambo 3 or whatever it was, right? Now, in, in this case, we, we got actually, um, you know, something that's in, in a way, you know, for the people, like anarchists, you know, fighting in there in Rojava and in Syria. So, but, um, you know, so Turkey's coming there and attacking, and, and that's, that's to be expected. And, you know, you know, like the United States government is, you know, in my opinion, will just be given, you know, they'll say don't do that and then not, not, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Because, like, it's a threat, right? It's a threat to, you know, all the governments of this world for anything like this to, you know, be happening, you know. 
It's just like during the Spanish Revolution, what happened? You know, the first thing they did is, is crush the anarchists, you know, the, the communists. You know, so just like what we were speaking before. I mean, in my question, I wanted to reiterate, you know, it's like if this is going to happen, it's going to be probably in spite of, you know, the, uh, the leftist parties, you know, in Chicago land area, in the United States, if we get organizations, it's going to be in spite, you know, and I'll list a few and I probably won't list enough of them, but it'll be, in, you know, in spite of, you know, the CPUSA, it'll be in spite of the RCP, you know, it'll be in spite of the Sparse and, you know, all the other ones as well, but I, those, those are probably the three I wanted to get off, off my chest. It's, go, it's going to have to be the people organizing from the, you know, bottom up. You know that that's how how we're gonna have to have to do it, and uh, you know just like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be speaking, uh, uh, you know on the first on uh, the first uh, speaking in May, and I'm gonna be talking about the UPS contract campaign, and I'm gonna be talking about the struggle in the previous contract campaign, how UPS retaliated and fired you know the organizers that organized the vote no, and you know I'm gonna have to you know go to the setting of the 97 strike and. Uh, where we got here today about the current contract coming up and what's going to have to be done it's going to have to be rank and file members from the bottom up organizing wildcatting if necessary to win the amount the members are involved is the you know is the the, the strength of the contract that we're going to get is based on the membership thank you very much Uh, Murray Bookchin, uh, who is the formulator of Libertarian Municipalism, spoke at the Libertarian Party convention in 79. Uh, this was at a time where uh, he was friends with Carl Hess. Carl Hess was a libertarian uh, activist, I guess you could call him a left libertarian. Uh, and he's, this is a kernel libertarianism that has often been overlooked in the modern American libertarian history. Uh, because the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian Municipalism, they, uh, they both hold voluntary association as virtues, I would like to invite my friends here at the Passero Dignitoso Affinity Group uh, to uh, look into the Libertarian Party as a means to achieve a transparent and not aggressive society. As some of the other people have rebutted, the state is not going to wither away. And at least not uh, without a fight, and one of the ways that we can uh, do this is to get into power, uh, elect, you know, be elected to power and uh, disable some of the uh, status structure that holds some of these organizations from forming. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yeah. Oh boy, I've got a couple of shorts on the line. Um, somebody asked about prisons. The United States is less than one twentieth of the world's population and has one quarter of the world's prisoners. So clearly, whatever it is we've got now could hardly be worse. Back off the mic a little bit, please. Oh, okay, back off the mic a little. Yeah. Somebody said, but how do we take over? Um, well, one day, Everybody goes to work just like usual and does their job just like usual with one exception. Ignore the bosses. You know the, your, your job, do it. That's it. Um, I don't think I have yet directly addressed the, the, the happy, simplistic, eighth grade comic book version of capitalism that we get up here two weeks out of three. <laughs> In the year 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, over one half of the total capital in the entire United States was slaves. Right here in Chicago, from the Haymarket Police Riot of 1886 to the Republic Steel Massacre of 1937, a half century of class warfare, of people organizing, fighting, and being killed, established the eight-hour day. So the fantasy that the blessings of capitalism fall like manna from heaven has nothing to do with reality. 
Capitalism is quite successful because it is the most efficient, effective system ever devised for extracting surplus labor. And for the laborers to get the fruit of their labor back, they have to fight and die. Uh, we can, I, can, I can go on at inordinate length listing massacres and strikes and fights, but right here we've got Bacon's Rebellion, we've got Shea's Rebellion, we've got the Whiskey Rebellion, where the newly minted federal government was in the hands of people who deliberately provoked a rebellion by screwing the poor in order to suppress the rebellion and establish the, the primacy of the federal power. That's Alexander Hamilton's Whiskey Rebellion. Um, this, this jive about how wonderful capitalism is for us all, uh, I, I'm sorry, is simply ignorant. Thank you. No, uh, and that's three minutes. I, I can accept that. Hi, I'm Aaron Sanders. I, I am a good answer a former kibbutz member in Israel. I am a member of the International Association of Machinists, a working truck driver. I'm going to just share some food for thought. I'm not going to demand anything. When I lived on kibbutz, it was a marvelous experience back when it was still kibbutz. It was direct democracy, voluntary socialism. Socialism loses its beauty when it's coerced. Um, when it's voluntary, it's a great thing. However, um, there was a question asked earlier about uh, how you seize the means of production. Well, you don't seize it. You allow for the owners to make their money. You just don't allow them to um, exploit their workers. You allow the, what happens is you remove through your delegates um, the forceful state-sponsored oppression of unions, of organic unions. So if natural organic unions can rise up from within, they start making demands. And if they need to, they can wildcat and they can strike and you don't have the police coming in and stopping those strikes. Okay, so if you allow for truly organic growth of community uh, things, and a community can be a community of workers within the workplace. It need not necessarily be location-based. But the idea is you do have to keep it small because if you, do, if you go large, your individual units have to be small, and then you do need to have delegates, but delegates have to do exactly what their councils tell them to do. And you do need the need of recall, and I thank our speakers for their subject matter tonight. I don't, the other thing I want you to think about is these things can occur, but usually they only, they mostly occur in a vacuum of some sort, or out of a need, of a necessity. Rojava, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sure. Uh, there's a void, there's a, there's a void, a vacuum in Syria right now, and the Kurds are asserting themselves and they're trying to work things out for themselves out of necessity. Kibbutzim, you know, people, Jews were going back to traditional Palestine and trying to reclaim a dead land. Okay, and out of the means of necessity, they banded together workers banded together and created these gardens in the desert. Okay, these things happen in voids. Now, quest, and I don't have the answer to this, and it's food for thought and maybe for another session sometime, how do we go about looking for those voids where people can start working together? That's it, I'm thanks. statements in this. This is all, this all about the, the government change and economic change. It's, it's, it's quite a bit to talk about. But I have to focus on one thing, and I don't want really to answer this either, is this transfer of property. What is communal property and what is some private property? It's kind of uh, criminal to see some people own so much land, which is so precious. Some people don't have any land. So I think all this hinges on how to deal with property, how do you handle communal and 
and private property in this. This is a very important issue. One topic. I think you should do a research and uh, study on that. Not that I know. I don't know how to do it. Uh, other people do the work on it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I have a question for all of you. Who of you have read Tolstoy? Which work? War and Peace? Many years ago. Anna Karenina? I will sing to an audio book of the Kingdom of God. Pardon? I will sing to audio of the Kingdom of God is within you. Uh, so I, I didn't recognize that in Tolstoy. If it is, it is. But you have read it. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that those works touch in humanity uh, at, at the deepest level. And uh, uh, we as a society have something to have ignored the value of these, uh, of these uh, works that have lasted for and survived the, the, the passage of time because of their importance in understanding our own behavior and our own uh, shortcomings. So when I was 18, I, I read these this pieces as I was going to the university in my long trip in the buses. I, I have the opportunity to read this, and I was so in, uh, so embedded into the reading that many times I went to the end of the line of the bus, and then I have to take the bus back to where I was supposed to get off. And so, anyway, uh, that I, I think we should pay attention to uh, works of literature because it will enhance our understanding of what's going on today. Next. Hello, uh, my name's Tom Rainey. I, it's the first time that I've been at a political leftist meeting in many months. I was incarcerated for four months after a protest at an Antifa protest in August. And I've actually been fearful and having terrible anxiety about even coming back out and um, confronting actual activists in the real world uh, since my case was concluded, and I'm happy to say my case was concluded down to a, a misdemeanor. But the reason that I was uh, driven to come out to this meeting was the concept of uh, Bookchin's democratic confederalism which always really grabbed my imagination as a youth. And I found it, as a youth, the uh, democratic confederalism often counterposed to Karl Marx's ideas of freely associated labor at the point of production. And I could never understand why Bukchin and Donayevskaya had such a big fight. And there was always obviously something that happened. I was a Donetskyist as a youth. And they hated Bukchin. And I could never understand why, because on the face of it, especially to the young anarchists in the 80s and the 90s, the concept of democratic confederalism really grabbed people's imagination. Like, why not? This makes sense. The people at the local areas can organize themselves. It was the first idea where we heard about assemblies, where now assemblies are our global concept that drove the national and the global Occupy movement, the concept of the neighborhood assemblies. And yet, they seem not to be connected to the concept of control at the point of production. To me, that's what's missing. That's why I never became a Buchanite and that I stayed a Donayevskyist, a Marxist humanist. I've had many discussions with my comrade Ted here about his concepts of the grand assemblies, the multiple different uh, logical and rational assemblies, and on the face of it, they make all kinds of sense. The people get together in their neighborhoods, they meet with the people that they know, they make the decisions that affect their immediate lives. And yet, 
it's still the control, the direct, immediate control of workers at the point of production that seems to be so hard for people to even want to talk about. It almost seems like it's a mystery that when I speak to people about it, their, their eyes almost glaze over, like, what are you talking about? You actually think that workers could run production at the point of production? And this is a huge, huge crisis, and it seems to be a, a conflict in thought. It's very difficult to get over into from having a, a general meeting like an Occupy type of a, a political reformist meeting and to say, well, you know, the capitalists need the workers. The workers don't really need the capitalists. And people will say, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. That makes sense. But you never really, I don't think people really absolutely believe it. And in today's world, we no longer have many generations to try to create the socialist project. In fact, we may only have one generation before global warming is going to make it impossible for us to win. And I say, what's going to be new? What are we going to do that's new? Thank you. How are you more Good A good Super Bowl in is today. We should be talking about the Super Bowl. And I predict the winner of the Super Bowl will be Minnesota. It'd be nice if they got in there. But Minnesota will win either one. The state of Minnesota. Here, I got some. Okay, they use the word, uh, words of wisdom. Does everybody know what the word, the difference between wisdom and knowledge is? No. Knowledge is facts that that, that facts you get from a, a horizontal lane, and wisdom is from above, like. And uh, I was a monk. Uh, when I was in high school, they said, join the Navy and see the world, join the Trappist monks and see the other world. So I was a Trappist monk for seven years. No meat, fish, or eggs. There was a rule of silence, not a vow, but a rule of silence. What does this have to do with utopia? Uh, uh, that, uh, we should be talking today about the Super Bowl. <laughs> we, we, Why? How many times has this past year have we talked about liberalism? There's not, not enough. There's nothing, not enough. Okay, we, we mentioned about dreams. It's not a sports car. We mentioned about, somebody mentioned dreams. On five consecutive days, I had the same dream, a little augmented. On five consecutive days, the same dream, a little augmented. I won't go into detail. We should talk about dreams, about comedians. Who was the greatest comedian? Just lately, I hit um, Red Skelton. I forgot all, all about Red Skelton. But who was the greatest comedian? Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Marx. Who? Karl Marx. <laughs> but I think it's uh, uh, Charlie Callis. Charlie's name is Charlie Callis is, is funny beyond belief. I forgot all about him. And uh, the moon landing two, two weeks ago, that was the stupidest. He said the hundred, he's a hundred percent sure that we did not land on the moon. It's a hoax. You should have asked the people. There was a bunch of people there in that whole row there. They took off. You should have asked them. You think that was a, a, a was a hoax or not? What about the moon rocks? Nobody criticized so us going there. And the uh, mock well, I'll leave the word with football. Uh, uh, for those who do not know, the patron saint of football is, I asked this several times, and he said that Mike Ditka, no. It was uh, St. Lawrence, um, he lived in the second or third century. He was like a deacon, and um, somebody came, they were gonna rob him over here. So we gave all the treasures and money away, and they roasted him on the uh, gridiron. They roasted uh, uh, St. Lawrence, uh, they roasted him on the gridiron, and I made him the uh, patron saint of football. And I, one of his words, his last words were, while well, he was roasting on the good iron, he says, you, uh, you can turn me over because on this side, I am well done. Spoken like a true Patriots fan. Uh, All right.
I would first of all like to thank the young people who spoke up here. Whether I agree with them or not is irrelevant. They had every right to speak, and I'm glad that they were here. Good. Where I take sharp, sharp exception is when the resident Trumpist, who has already left, said that the young lady who spoke had no right to speak here because she comes from Turkey. Well, he can stuff it as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyone has the right to speak here. And it doesn't matter where they're from. In fact, if he doesn't like where people came from, why doesn't he go back to wherever his forebears came from? Um, then there's my our good friend brother Joe and his efforts to deal with um, Steve, what's his name? Um, I'm having a senior moment here, Joe. Uh, ben Steve. Steve Bannon. Thank you. I'm all in favor of your uh, of your work, Joe, particularly since I consider Steve Bannon to be the, the modern equivalent of Julius Stryker. For those who don't know who he was, he was one of the worst of the anti-Semites, and that's saying quite a bit in Nazi Germany. Even some of the other anti-Semites, like Hermann Goering, and that doesn't make mean that their anti-Semitism was somehow better. It was not merely that even they couldn't stomach him. And he wound up, like Gowering, being convicted at Nuremberg, and he wound, and Stryker wound up being hanged there. And um, finally, however, there was one inaccuracy in particular that some of you pointed, or one statement that some whose inaccuracy I would like to point out. Illinois has not always been a reliably blue state. Uh, in, night, in the 80s, the state went for Reagan. Everybody went for Reagan. And in earlier years, in 68 and 72, Illinois went for Nixon. And so this state used to be a bellwether, and we used to bounce back and forth between the Republicans and the Democrats. And it's only been since like the 90s that this state has been reliably 100% Democratic. And even there, look what happened in 2014. Bruce Rauner got in as governor. Yeah. Hopefully he will be gone after this fall. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Charlie. All right, got a little time here. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual. First of all, let's thank our speakers. All three of them. I guess you got a little book here for sale there, which gives some detail and outline to your concepts you've been developing at. Um, I've read over the years a number of things on the what used to be called the, I don't use the term too much anymore, called the utopian communities, uh, such as in New Harmony, Indiana. And, and I lived and worked among the, the Amish, uh, uh, who also, that's somewhat why I was reading them, operations and how the community collectives work together. Uh, particularly in rural areas. Um, so I recommend looking into some of that, what the efforts were in that, in that regard. Uh, the subject seemed to lose ground in discussion after the turn of the century. Somebody hit on it earlier, private property seems to be an issue in any efforts in this nature. Uh, the uh, and I see the libertarians are here who have a seemingly inherent aversion to any sort of collective action claiming this is coercion, which is not always a valid uh, position uh, to take. One thing about organizations, even the assemblies, a reality of this, and I know this from operating locals, I'm a field organizer for your machinists, by the way, not, not in your area. Uh, every local is about four or five people. So I think if you do have a collective, you're going to have to, you're going to have to find those four or five people. Uh, that's what we do with our locals. Uh, if you find those qualified people who are willing to put the time and effort into it, it will succeed. You know, and without that dedication, uh, it, it's enormous. Government stuff can be boring administratively, and many people don't have an aptitude for it. 
there's about 2,500 pieces of legislation pending at any one time in Congress. Uh, for anybody to keep up on that who isn't professionally inclined, it requires some effort to know exactly what you're voting on and to keep abreast of it. So government requires some effort, uh, whether or not you have that in the community. Otherwise, I, I, the greatest fear is people don't know what it is they're voting on. Uh, regarding candidates, so you mentioned there, well, you, you went to vote and you couldn't find a candidate you like. You know, I've been working loads of campaigns over the years. I'll be quite honest with you. I mean, when I think about it, I said this the other day, I really never found many candidates that I truly like as people. I don't know what it is. They're just not a... I just don't like them. I mean, they're all right, but I just don't think they're like, you know, people I would, you know, seek out enduring friendships. You know, uh, it's one of the things about, yeah, we... I'll tell you, the thing is, they do have to get signatures. You, there is some effort criteria for becoming a candidate. I'll tell you, the one lot most people don't realize is, and we use this in making endorsements at IVI, uh, people don't put together viable campaigns. And I've seen that in this campaign. I asked some candidates, I said, what are you going to do to campaign to win? Oh, they got on the ballot. I go, what are you going to do to campaign to win? And they didn't have anything. Uh, quickly, we got a little time here. Uh, trust is baloney. There's no trust in capitalism because there's fraud and there's no compliance with contracts. You're bringing some humanistic thing into what is nothing but a transaction for making money. And this all oh, this all oh, this trust. And it's been there's no trust without the threat of throwing some guy in jail. And it's been the greatest fraud. economic engine and, that's and caused more people to prosper. And unless you have somebody who enforces compliance with contracts, capitalism is an absolute and total failure. <laughs> Zero. Thank you very much. Come again when we have an update on this. Yeah, you all trust. Trust me. <laughs> Trust the capitalists. For those of you that might have uh, seen some of the old Star Trek episodes, they talked about concepts like what we're talking about tonight. They visited different societies that were organized in different ways and uh, looking at it through the lens of the future, how they solved problems and got through problems like what we're talking about right now. There was, there was one classic we we'll start the, the Enterprise with Captain Kirk. They're, they're flying through. The Enterprise starts picking up speed. It's going faster and faster, and finally it exceeds warp nine or whatever it was. And you know, they, they have no idea what's going on. They did, boom, everything is black. And Kirk says, I'll stop. And he looks at Spock and he says, what happened? And Spock says, well, unknown, Captain. And he said, well, where are we? Uh, unknown, Captain. He said, well, can you speculate? He says, well, Spock says, we appear to pass through some kind of a barrier. And Kirk says, well, what kind of a barrier do you think it was? He said, well, it was a barrier between where we were and where we are. <laughs> <laughs> are you trying to be funny, Spock? <laughs> America is, people are divided on many different subjects because of the black hole of the media. The media's job in America is to maintain people in a bubble of mythology on certain subjects, believing things that aren't real. For example, uh, some people still believe that capitalism is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It is. They don't know about Professor McMurtry from Canada published a book in 1999 called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And we're in the final stages now. He said, if you let billionaire predators with no ethics, no morals, no conscience, you let them rise to the top and, and amass the wealth in billions, they'll get big like sharks, mindless sharks, and just eat everything in sight and destroy the country. That is exactly what we are seeing with the Trump administration right now. <laughs> they want to roll back all regulations that protect, protect air, water, soil from pollution, lead, toxic, all kinds of stuff. There's an article, I believe it's on uh, Common Dreams right now, saying uh, the Trump administration is 
trying to make uh, nuclear war winnable again uh, by using small nukes that won't eliminate whole entire 100-mile squares, just a 10-mile radius or something. We're seeing uh, the doctors in 1983-84 said, these people aren't in an insane asylum somewhere being treated for their mental illness. They're in the president's cabinet. Uh, the, 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 uh, T.K. Jones was talking about uh, nuclear war is not a problem as long as every American has his own shovel and his own foxhole. The doctor said, there's an example of what we call insanity on the hoof, prime beef as it were. One of Reagan's top advisors, and we thought that insanity was put behind us 30 years ago until Trump was installed. For those of you that don't know yet, they're still divided. Don't let anybody tell you that the American people voted for Trump and voted him in. Less than 25% of eligible voters actually cast a vote for Trump. The other 75% half didn't vote, but the majority voted for Hillary, and then they just changed the vote totals in three states with the electronic machines after we went to bed. That's what they've been doing ever since George Bush was installed in the year 2000. So, uh, again, okay. to solve, the first uh, way you solve a problem is identifying, correctly identify the problem. Log on to Common Dreams and Truth out every day and look at the best of the best. Also, one final note, um, i got 10 seconds left. Uh, there's a cooperative called the Mondragon Co-op in Spain. That, uh, you guys, uh, you know, if you ever come back, talk about that for half an hour. Because there, there's 75,000 people in that co-op, and uh, they've organized a lot of things like what our speakers are talking about tonight. So there's good things happening around the world where other people are showing us the way. You know, uh, the age of capitalism is not just what we have to accept. Okay, and, okay. And thank you. Speaker gets the last word. You guys get the last word. Thank you. Tell them at the after party. That's what the after party is for. I'm very slim bromage about these things. All right. So, um, we can each of us have a... If it's long, if we got, only got about seven minutes. Yeah, yeah we got to get out of here at quarter to nine. Oh, you guys want to... I mean, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to make a couple comments, um, not necessarily re-rebuttals, but uh, uh, you mentioned um, not seizing the means of production necessarily, not making it coercive, and I think uh, that's a really interesting question, and it's another thing that'll be debated maybe forever, but I, I think that it's right, um, and because going back to the Paris Commune, they had this moment where there was a vacuum, and they were allowed to decide on certain things, and there was actually these moments where they didn't necessarily have to just seize production and, and have this huge coercive violent um, movement within the Paris Commune, but there were actually moments where landlords were still owning a house, and they actually had to go to this council and go through a process where they said, are we going to require them to pay back all this debt that this landlord put them through? They were basically burning furniture just to stay alive. And now the landlord expects them to pay for this, that they were burning stuff just to stay alive. And the council decided, no, we're not going to uphold that property law. So this was an example where they didn't really have to just take everything from the landlord, but the people decided, basically dem democracy decided, yes, we're not going to uphold your property rights in this case because this person's life is way more valuable. And of course, there were um, times where they did seize some means of production, right? Some workers did take their ownership, but it was allowed to go to a process of democracy rather than, uh, you know, some other form that we could imagine. So I think that's really uh, a really important question, an important concept. Um, then there was the question from you, I think, of the, the idea of communal versus private property. And this one is another uh, er area that really needs to be cleared up um, because private property doesn't refer to, you know, what you own in your house, your, your stuff, all this stuff. And, and a lot of times people who, you know, uh, adhere to capitalism kind of assume that's what we're talking about. But there's actually this quotation in the Communist Manifesto going all the way back where Marx says, should we be taking, you know, family businesses, small restaurants and stuff? And he says, no, that's not actually what we're trying to do. And um, he didn't necessarily come down and say, this is where we take it, this is where we allow people to have it. But it, it brought up the question of what actually is um, property that becomes harmful for 
the lower classes, working classes, working poor, etc. And it it was there is some some kind of gray area or some some area to be decided, but also not all of socialist property happens to be owned by the state or some municipality. Um, worker cooperatives and stuff like that are owned by the workers themselves and not some state, so that there is plenty of room to have democratic forms of property that do have incentives to carry on. And I think it's, it's important to point that out because sometimes things get broken down to a dichotomy of this has to be either state ownership or it's right some really small uh, level or, pri or personal ownership or something. And it, it's to be decided where exactly we draw these lines. But, but yeah, that's, it's an important question. And then um, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. There was the question asked, why delegates at all? And um, a lot of people would agree that delegates are necessary. Although I can only speak to my experience, and my friends might disagree. But uh, I, I worked in some some councils and some assemblies, and eventually, actually, things do get really tiring and exhausting. You can have assemblies go on forever. So without some kind of mechanism or ability to kind of, you know, allow the process to go in a, an orderly fashion, and have some kind of delegate that has instant recall, it. For us, it was just that we preferred to have some kind of delegative process, although other communities might decide, no, we don't want any at all. And I think that should be left to them. So I'll let them go. Okay. So I wanted to address a couple things really, really quick. Um, the, the possibility of reform, real quickly. I do not believe that reform of this system is possible. Uh, you may disagree, but the truth of the matter is we already tried to reform it. We tried to reform it under FDR, and it worked great for some people in the middle class for 30 years or so. And then all of a sudden their kids forgot how bad things were for their grandparents, and then we wound up going with runaway capitalism. And now we're essentially at the point where we're just trying to make sure people aren't killing themselves at their jobs. I mean, the suicide rates have skyrocketed. We are at the point of wealth inequality that is greater than the pharaohs of Egypt, greater than any point in human history, and the time of revolution is essentially at hand. Um, also, you, you talk about how capitalism is wonderful and has brought so many people out of poverty. That's entirely false. It keeps people in poverty. And the reason for that is because the only way for a few people to have that much wealth is to keep people down. Why do you think we have prison slavery? Capitalism has never existed without slavery or people to exploit at a massive level. It's either been slaves, which prisons are slaves, or migrant workers who they can pay nothing, or a group of people that they can make do shitty jobs that nobody wants to do, things like that. Also, I'd just like to say, please stop looking for heroes to save you. They are not coming. Nobody is coming to save you. There is no person you can elect who is going to help you. They will help themselves. That's why we all need to work together, and then it, through helping ourselves, we help everybody. That's essentially the entire idea about anarchist communism. And Give a shout in. Just real quick, sorry. Yeah. Because they're really champion, but they don't want to lose their status here at the restaurant. So I just want to conclude by uh, saying that uh, we appreciate your time here. And if you personally, individually, or as a group would like to get in touch with us, we have booklets at the back desk there, where we uh, we try to uh, outline a concept of what this could look like in a city like Chicago. It's not a blueprint per se, it's a concept. It's just a way to try to like concretize these ideas. And I also, I, I'm also an active member uh, in the uh, Democratic Socialist of America, where I am trying to like push forward this project of bringing together like community councils. So if you're interested in that too, I would love to like hear from you. And yeah, I'll just like conclude sort of like we're, we're good here. Thank you again. Okay, have a shout, Andy. Have a shout, Andy.
we, hello, uh, if you uh, collect your goats and stuff and head to the back, uh, the, the bus boys have to clean this thing up before uh, by the night. So, okay. thank you all for coming, and we will see you next Devil's week. Devil's down there behind. Yeah. We're adjourned. Thank you.